If you wanted to quietly win a war without firing a single bullet, China in the 20th century was the place to do it. And Ye Pei Da, he was the man who figured out how. For more than six decades, Ye didn't fight from the front lines. He operated behind them, wiring a nation for total communication dominance. Microwave systems, fiber optic networks, free space lasers. Ye didn't just teach these things, he built them from scratch while most of the world had never even heard his name. This wasn't about better phones or faster internet. This was about power. How a country builds the invisible infrastructure that lets it control its people, project its ideology, and eventually challenge the West. The silent war for information didn't begin with TikTok or 5G. It began with one man, hunched over blueprints in bomb shelters, sketching the early codes of what would become China's modern telecom empire. He outlived emperors, survived revolutions, and outmaneuvered ministries that tried to erase him. But here's the crazy part. Almost no one outside China knows who Ye Pei Da was. Until now. Because this is the untold story of the man who didn't just build China's communications network. He helped weaponize it. Ye Pei Da was born in 1915 a time when China wasn't even a unified country. It was fractured, humiliated, and ruled by warlords who answered to no one. Foreign powers controlled entire chunks of the nation, and the so-called Republic of China barely holding on. So from the moment Ye took his first breath, survival wasn't a given, it was a gamble. But Ye wasn't raised with a sword, he was raised with wires, studying electrical engineering at Peiyang University. China's top tech institute at the time. He had one focus, telecommunications, the invisible nervous system that makes modern nations function. Then, in 1937, all hell broke loose. Japan invaded. Tianjin, where Ye was studying, fell under occupation. Peiyang University fled west, becoming a refugee school overnight. And Ye, he graduated in exile. But instead of running, he doubled down, by 1940, he was working as a technician in Chongqing, the wartime capital of China, building and maintaining radio systems for the central broadcasting station. His workshop wasn't some peaceful lab. It was a bomb shelter, deep underground, with Japanese planes dropping explosives overhead almost daily. That's where Ye learned a lesson most engineers never face. Information isn't just power, it's protection. During those years, broadcasting wasn't just about music or news. It was national defense, and Ye became obsessed with making signals stronger, clearer, and unbreakable. And then, he vanished. Not from China, from the war zone. In 1945, with the Japanese surrender finally in sight, Ye aced a government scholarship exam with the highest score in the country. Destination, Columbia University in New York City. There, he studied the bleeding edge of telecom theory. He interned at NBC, saw America's radio empire up close, and even worked with Nortel, a Canadian giant in radio transmission. He could have stayed, he could have had a cushy life in the West. But when the war ended, Ye made a decision that would shape the next 60 years of Chinese history. He came back, and he came back to a country on the brink of total collapse. By 1949, China was on fire, again. This time, it wasn't foreign armies tearing it apart, it was Chinese versus Chinese. The Kuomintang, backed by the US, had lost the civil war. The Communist Party had taken the mainland. Most Western-educated elites packed their bags and fled, with the nationalists, to Taiwan, and they begged Ye to come with them. After all, he had a Western degree, American job offers, and every reason to leave. But he didn't. Ye made the most dangerous choice a man in his position could make. He stayed, not to get rich, not for politics, but because he believed something few people did at the time, that a war-torn, dirt-poor communist China could one day become a telecom superpower. And Ye didn't waste time. He was quickly tapped to help build the new regime's Central People's Broadcasting Station in Beijing, the propaganda and communication arm of the Chinese Communist Party. This wasn't just about playing news reports. This was about nation-building through information control. By 1950, Ye was appointed professor at his old university, now renamed Tianjin University. Within two years, 
He was leading the entire Department of Telecommunications, but he had bigger plans. In 1955, the Chinese government founded a new institution, the Beijing Institute of Posts and Telecommunications, a place where engineers would train to build the country's entire communications infrastructure from the ground up. And Ye? He wasn't just a professor there. He was a founding architect, shaping the curriculum, the labs, and the minds that would go on to wire China's vast territory for the coming information age. It was a quiet move. There were no headlines, no parades. But make no mistake, Ye Pei Da had just put himself at the center of China's future telecom empire. He was building a battlefield, not one with soldiers, but one with towers, signals, antennas, and control. And most of the world didn't even know it was happening. But just as Ye began laying the groundwork for something revolutionary, China turned on itself, and Ye would pay the price. By the mid-1950s, Ye Peida had quietly become a cornerstone of China's telecom strategy. But this wasn't about teaching kids how to fix radios. This was war preparation, disguised as education. In 1956, just a year after helping launch the Beijing Institute of Posts and Telecommunications, Ye did something no Chinese scientist had done before. He launched research into microwave communication, the same high-frequency tech used by advanced militaries for encrypted, long-distance transmission. And he didn't stop there. He oversaw the construction of China's first 100-kilowatt broadcast transmitter, a monster machine powerful enough to reach across provinces. Then he built the nation's largest rhombic antenna network, a web of long-range towers that could blast signals through China's vast terrain and hostile weather. This wasn't just academic. In a country with weak roads and no satellites, radio waves were national arteries. Controlling them meant controlling the narrative, and more importantly, the battlefield. But Ye wasn't building just for the present. He saw the future coming, and it was optical. In 1964, decades before fiber optics became a global buzzword, Ye pioneered free space optical communication in China. Lasers transmitting data through air, no cables, no wires, just light cutting through the atmosphere like a surgical blade. After 1978, once China reopened to the world, Ye led the charge into fiber optic communication, making breakthrough after breakthrough. He figured out how to reduce interference, eliminate signal noise, and make fiber transmission stable across long distances. These weren't just tech upgrades, they were foundational shifts the kind that allow surveillance networks, secure military channels, internet backbones, and even space communications to exist. Behind the chalkboard and the lab coat, Ye wasn't just an educator. He was the strategic engineer of China's invisible battlefield, laying down the very systems that would one day power mass media, state censorship, digital surveillance, and international cyber warfare. By the mid-1960s, Ye Peida had done more for China's communication future than perhaps any man alive. He had helped build the state's transmission backbone, trained an entire generation of engineers, and was preparing China to leap into the digital age. But none of that would matter when the Cultural Revolution arrived. In 1966, Chairman Mao launched one of the most destructive political purges in modern history. Intellectuals were labeled traitors, professors were beaten in the streets, and science was branded as bourgeois corruption. Ye Pei Da, a Western-educated expert, affiliated with elite institutions, had no chance. He was stripped of his titles, removed from his posts, and exiled to a May 7th cadre school, a rural labor camp where China's intellectual class was sent to break rocks and grow crops. His lab? Gone. His lectures? Banned. His life's work? On hold. And yet, Ye never defected, never fled, never spoke out. For over a decade, he waited, quiet, watching. Then, in 1978, after Mao's death and Deng Xiaoping's rise, China reopened to science, industry, and the outside world. And Ye returned, like a ghost from the past. But he didn't come back bitter or broken. He came back strategic, ready to not just rebuild the system, but to reform it. By the early 1980s, Ye was appointed president of the Beijing Institute of Posts and Telecommunications the same institution that had been purged just years before. He didn't waste time. He started pushing boundaries again. This time, not just in engineering, but in policy. In 1985, Ye published an article in Red Flag, the Communist Party's flagship journal, arguing that China's telecom industry was outdated and dangerously centralized. At the time, 
All communications in the country were controlled by one bureaucratic leviathan, the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications. Yes saw it as a bottleneck, a weak point, and he wanted it dismantled. Then, in 1988, he crossed a line few dared to touch. Together with fellow academician Zhang Su, Yes submitted a formal report advising the breakup of the telecom monopoly, suggesting that the government create new shareholding companies to modernize and compete globally. People thought he'd gone mad. This was political suicide. His institute, BIPT, was directly under that very ministry, but Ye didn't care. He wasn't playing for favor, he was playing for the future. And then, something wild happened. The government listened. Instead of punishing him, Beijing adopted his proposal. State-run companies like China Telecom and China Mobile were born, the very corporations that would later become global giants. Ye had gone from exile to architect of a national telecom revolution. He wasn't just building systems anymore, he was reprogramming China's entire information infrastructure. By the late 1980s, Ye Peida had already done the unthinkable. He'd survived the Cultural Revolution, returned to power, and forced open the doors of one of China's most tightly controlled ministries. Most men would have stopped there, grateful just to be alive, let alone influential. But Ye wasn't most men. While the party promoted slogans about reform and openness, Ye was moving in silence, orchestrating a full-blown telecom coup. And what he proposed next would risk not just his career, but his entire legacy. Together with fellow academician Zhang Xu, Ye published a report that did more than criticize China's telecom structure. It challenged the core of how the state controlled information. Their solution? Break up the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, China's only communications gatekeeper, and replace it with semi-corporate entities that could operate with greater speed, flexibility, and even competition. To outsiders, this sounded like bureaucratic reform, but insiders knew what it really was a direct assault on state monopoly power. Remember, Ye's own institute, BIPT, was under the control of the very ministry he was now trying to dismantle. This wasn't just bold, it was borderline suicidal. His critics thought he'd crossed a red line. Some whispered that Ye had forgotten the revolution. Others warned that if this proposal gained traction, he'd be quietly removed, again. But Ye wasn't backing down, because he understood something most didn't. In the age of information, whoever controls the infrastructure wins. He wasn't just thinking about China. He was thinking about America, about Japan, about the tech giants rising abroad, and the digital wall China would need to build to survive. And then, the unthinkable happened. The Chinese government approved it, slowly at first, then all at once. Shareholding telecom companies were born. China Mobile, China Telecom, China Unicom, all modern giants in a system Ye had designed while walking a political tightrope. He didn't get statues. He didn't get slogans. But in Beijing's back rooms, the people who mattered knew. Ye Peida passed away quietly in 2011, at the age of 95. No viral headlines, no global tributes, just a modest obituary in the state press, honoring a professor, an engineer, and a patriot. But that's not the end of his story. Because more than a decade later, his fingerprints are everywhere. Every fiber optic cable that carries Chinese data across continents, every 5G tower that challenges Western dominance, every secure military channel built on domestic networks, not foreign imports, all of it traces back to the systems yet envisioned and the people he trained. Huawei, ZTE, China Mobile, these aren't just corporations. They're the living infrastructure of a vision Ye started drafting in a bomb shelter 80 years ago. When Western nations started sounding the alarm about China's global tech expansion, they were too late. The foundation had already been laid by a man most of them had never heard of. Even China's controversial Great Firewall, often criticized as a tool of censorship, is built on principles Ye helped pioneer. Signal clarity, routing control, nationally sovereign infrastructure, he didn't invent surveillance, but he made the tools that made it possible at scale, long before the internet became global currency. He never held political office. He never ran a company. But Ye Peida's legacy moves faster than any speech, stronger than any law. It pulses through cables, bounces off satellites, streams through every screen in China, and increasingly, beyond.
Ye once said the greatest honor in life wasn't being remembered. It was seeing your country catch up to the world and then surpass it. And today, as the world enters an era of digital cold war, Ye's ghost is everywhere. Not in portraits, but in signals. Everywhere and nowhere, like a true godfather of the invisible.